Good morning, everybody. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Alison Cleary and I'm the Executive Director of Open House Melbourne. It's my great pleasure to welcome you all here this morning to our lounge rooms from your lounge rooms and vice versa for this conversation about the Doherty Institute. Before I introduce our speakers and our amazing building, I just want to begin by acknowledging that all of Open House Melbourne's programming exists on what always was and always will be the land of the people of the Kulin Nation. We pay our respects to Elders past, present and emerging, as well as to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in the wider Melbourne community and beyond. Indigenous sovereignty has never been ceded in Australia and we try to be mindful of this in everything we do, given our focus on the built, modern built environment. And now to today's event, which I'm sure you're all keen to hear. As you know, the focus of the conversation is, of course, the Doherty Institute, but more specifically, the importance of collaboration in design and science and drilling down to look at the Doherty's design strategies and planning principles, as well as how it interfaces with the public realm. This discussion is happening across two platforms, both Zoom and Facebook Live. For those of you joining us via Zoom, could I ask you please to make sure your microphones and cameras are on mute for the course of the event. And there will be an opportunity to ask questions of our speakers. Um, however, only if you're on the Zoom platform. Apologies to Facebookers. Um, and we'd ask you to use the chat function at the bottom of your screen. Feel free to ask a question at any time, but please note that I'll be putting the questions to the speakers towards the end of the session. So don't get annoyed at me if I don't pick up on your questions immediately. Um, and now to the Doherty Institute and our guest speakers, Professor Sharon Lewin and Neil Stonnell. Peter Doherty Institute for Infection and Immunity is a keystone building within Melbourne's biomedical precinct and is a joint venture between the University of Melbourne and the Royal Melbourne, in Royal Melbourne Hospital. It's an infection and immunity powerhouse that combines research, public health and education. There are more than 700 staff at the Institute who work on infection and immunity through a broad spectrum of activities, which include discovery research, diagnosis, surveillance, and investigation of infectious disease outbreaks, all incredibly pertinent at this point in time, as well as the development of ways to prevent, treat, and eliminate infectious diseases. The building itself is a range of highly specialised laboratories, support spaces and integrated teaching facilities and promotes and prioritises collaboration and equally the health and wellbeing of the building users. And in January 2020, as many of you know, the Doherty Institute received global recognition as being the first lab outside of China to grow the SARS-CoV-2, which was a virus that causes COVID-19 in the laboratory and the first to share it with the WHO. Since then, and in an ongoing way, the Institute has been at the forefront of the global COVID-19 response. And now to our speakers. Professor Sharon Lewin is the inaugural director of the Doherty Institute and one of Australia's leading infectious diseases experts. She's also a professor of medicine at the University of Melbourne and a National Health and Medical Research Council practitioner fellow. As an infectious diseases physician and scientist, Professor Lewin's laboratory focus is on basic translational and clinical research aimed at finding a cure for HIV and understanding the interaction between HIV and Hep B viruses. She is also the chief investigator of an NRMRC Centre of Research Excellence, the Australian Partnership Preparedness Research on Infectious Diseases Emergencies, or a prize which aims to bring together Australia's leading experts in clinical, laboratory and public health research to address the key components required for a rapid and effective immediate response to infectious diseases. Professor Lewin was named Melbourneian of the Year in 2014 and was, ordered, was awarded the Peter Wills Medal by Research Australia in 2015. And then in 2019, she was appointed an Officer of the Order of Australia in recognition of her distinguished service to medical research, education and clinical care in the areas of infectious diseases and particularly HIV and AIDS. And Neil Stonnell. Neil is, is Grimshaw's Melbourne managing partner and a member of Grimshaw's Global Operations Group. He has extensive experience across a variety of building sectors and typologies, 
including rail, aviation, workplace, education, retail and master planning. And it's been instrumental to the delivery of many complex projects both throughout the region and globally for Grimshaw. He's played a pivotal role in the design and the realisation of the Doherty Institute, where he was responsible for the design and delivery of the building, including the complex stakeholder engagement sessions. And he ensured that the outcome was one that achieved excellence in both functionality and design. The Doherty itself was Grimshaw's second major project in Australia following Southern Cross Station. Some of their more recent projects have included the Mernda Rail Extension, the Older Fleet Workplace Tower, Kudabu Convention Centre in PNG, um, and Neil is currently overseeing Auckland City Rail Link, which is the largest transport infrastructure project ever undertaken in New Zealand. Now that we're through those formalities, I'd like to begin the conversation by asking both of you to have a think about the importance of collaboration in design and science. So there are a number of interesting parallels in the two areas of sort of architectural design, built environment design and science. Um, one of those key ones is the importance of collaboration. So could you both take a little bit of time to tell us a bit more about the importance of partnerships in terms of driving um, best practice outcomes? Maybe Neil, if you'd like to start. Oh, I'm happy to. Thank you, Alison. Thank you for that uh, introduction there. Um, uh, I guess uh, design is, is, the outcome of design is better through collaborative discussion. I think um, uh, scientific theory, and I'm loath to talk about scientific theory in, in, in front of an eminent scientist, but uh, it does suggest that issues are better resolved through uh, a diverse approach to problem solving. And I think architecture um, is better if it uh, engages with multiple opinions, multiple experiences, uh, and different perspectives on things. Um, and then that's led through a, a process of synthesis, um, extraction, and then, and then you develop the outcome. I think uh, whether you're working within a studio, uh, it should be multiple voices that are helping drive the design. But also as architects, I think you're better if you're working with a whole set of design um, team members, whether that's the engineers, the mechanical engineers, the structural engineers, the environmental engineers, but also taking the opportunity to partner uh, with other points of view. And, and the Doherty, we worked with Bill Adelis on um, as, as a, an, an architectural partner. We worked with S2F as uh, the um, services engineers and uh, JMP as the structural engineer. And, and as that kind of collaborative discussion working through uh, the product that you're trying to produce, I think it's essential that there's multiple opinions. Uh, and then you know we can talk we can talk about how we engage with actually the various organisations that became part of the Doherty Institute. So I think uh, architecture is definitely richer if it's if it's driven through a kind of a sieve of diverse opinion. Sharon, did you have anything to add to that? Yeah, thanks, Alison, and thanks Open House Melbourne for choosing the Doherty Institute as um, one of your uh, buildings to focus on. Um, you know, collaboration in science is absolutely key, especially if you're going to tackle big problems. Um, science has become more and more complicated. We're achieving greater and greater things, but um, that means that you need a lot of different um, disciplines to tackle a big problem. And just to give you an example of how things have changed, um, when Peter Doherty was awarded the his Nobel Prize um, in 1996, for work he did in the 70s in Canberra, the paper for which he uh, was, he and his partner, Ralph Zinkenagel, who also got the Nobel Prize, was, a, was based on two papers. They were Doherty and Zinkenagel and Zinkenagel and Doherty. So that's what science was like in the 70s. If you look at most scientific publications now, they would have 20 odd um, uh, authors on them. That would be standard, um, let alone some really big papers might have 50 plus. So science is more complicated. And then just second to that, it's not just science, it's when you want to, just doing science for me personally, but I think uh, for the, certainly for the Institute and I think increasingly so for scientists across the world, um, you want an outcome from the science you do, um, an impact on society, economy, or whatever. And so therefore, if you really want an impact and to translate your science, it's even a bigger argument for um, multidisciplinary engagement. And that is essentially what the Doherty's about because it spans discovery, research, 
through to the clinic, through to implementation into communities. And that's why you need all these different partners to have an impact. Great. Well, if taking that as a context, so collaboration as a context, let's focus into the doherty itself. And Neil, can you start by telling me a little bit, or all of us, not just me, um, a little bit more about how the design of the doherty itself was a design process in partnership? What, what did that look like? Uh, well, I spoke a little bit about the design team um, and how we came together as um, as kind of design um, in individuals and a collective to develop the the, um, the project. Um, if I, if I look at the kind of history through a kind of collaborative process, we were approached by the University of Melbourne in two thousand and eight to look at a very quick uh, concept design for the site for uh, of the, the future of the uh, Doherty Institute. We did a very, very quick collaborative um, uh, design with the university. And then that was submitted for some heat funding at the time as part of the, the stimulus funding for the GFC. At that point, we then needed to get on board uh, a number of other organizations uh, to develop that. So selecting the engineers, as I spoke about earlier, we then invited uh, Ron Billard and his team into the, the conversation about developing a strategic brief. And then you're working with all the various organisations and institutes that actually go into the building. And that was a particularly intensive process. I and mean, I've got on screen um, uh, just a, a, few, a few slides and images where we'll talk to uh, help illustrate some, some of the things. But there are a number of organisations that went into the building. Um, and they all had their own demands, desires, aspirations. And there was a really, really intensive stakeholder management process that we went through, an engagement process to, uh, to see what each of those organizations wanted, how they were gonna to work together, how they were gonna to exist together and the proximities that they needed within the building. So both the design team and the people that were gonna inhabit the building needed to uh, really understand how best to coexist and how best to kind of push forward a design. So it was pretty intensive. And certainly the, uh, the stakeholder engagement process that I was involved in here was one of the most intense and one of the most detailed in, in many projects that I've been involved in. So it was, um, you know, it was, a, it was a very, very engaging process and Professor James McCluskey was the champion for that process on behalf of the university, but it was uh, really engaging and really, intriguing in terms of how the organizations wanted to coexist together and as Sharon said um, being in the building as a as a collective of organizations and institutes to create something uh, more singular um, through uh, a, an increased critical mass and that opportunity for collaboration once they were in it so it was a, a process about collaborating through the design process but also to create a product for collaboration and so Sharon from the perspective of um the client and I know that you weren't actually with the Institute during this development phase but on because you joined once the Institute itself um, opened but what was the vision what was your understanding of the vision of the various organizations coming together to create the, the Doherty? Yeah thanks Alison as you said I didn't join um, I came on as director when the institute opened on in September 2014 and so I was not there for the design phase or the um, all that extensive work that was done to bring these different um, stakeholder groups together um, certainly the vision at the time uh, was that the Doherty was not going to be a research hotel and that by co-location people could do bigger and better things together um, and although operationally the departments, each of these departments work um, as individual departments, uh, they came together to realise a bigger vision. And um, I can talk a bit more about that later, but the, the, you know, the vision that we, we did obviously a lot of work too once we were actually in the building, because that was, we were moving from sort of being a federation of departments to an institute with a single vision. Um, and I uh, you know that vision is to improve health globally uh, through discovery research 
a prevention, treatment and cure of infectious diseases. And so people got behind that bigger vision, although we still operate within our departments. Um, but um, there were, as Neil talked about, some really significant technical requirements from each department. Um, we have a mix, although you can see um, whatever it is, uh, six dots on your screen. Um, it, it alt the, the Institute is a joint venture of University of Melbourne and Melbourne Health. Um, and uh, each, but each department has quite significant different demands, um, technically with regard to security, how their, um, their areas of quality control, the, the sort of national regulatory requirements they need to meet, all these sort of technical aspects. But so the, the areas that were shared, like, um, and you'll hear more about it, like our tea room, like the opening, um, the entrance to the institute, the auditorium, the boardrooms, you know, they were absolutely key to bring people together and, um, and try and get a blended, um, integrated vision and culture because these groups all had very different histories and cultures as well. Okay. I think that that's... Um Coming back then to you, Neil, following on from that, how taking those different cultures, those different visions, how did you want to talk us a bit through through a bit of the design strategies that you implemented and the planning principles that were used in order to bring all of those different cultures and visions together? Yeah, I can fly through very quickly some of the key design uh, uh, processes or the, the design attack that we had which really focused on making sure that the lab planning was effective and, and um, functional um, there was a, a series of collaborative or special spaces that were needed through the building where the, the various um, staff members would come together its integration as a very secure building in the urban realm and not being a fortress at street level was particularly key and then the environmental performance of the building and particularly the envelope and how the, 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 the building fabric responded. I mean, they were our key, um, uh, key sort of design imperatives. I'll, I'll, just, I'll just keep flicking through this uh, just very, very quickly to illustrate some of those. I mean, I, I'm hoping that most people on, on the talk will actually understand where the building is at the top of Elizabeth Street uh, near the Haymarket roundabout. I think one of the key things in terms of the site was that it sat at that hinge point between the Parkville campus of the University of Melbourne and the biomedical precincts uh, across the Royal Parade. So it was this sort of nexus between the clinicians and the um, students and the researchers coming together across the road from the School of Medicine. And because of that, it needed to, to face two different directions. It was facing towards the university, but it was also facing towards um, the, the hospitals across the road um, and needed to be a kind of high performing building that, that, that dealt with the labs but then also dealt with arrival and approach. Um, this, is, this is a diagram that we've been using through the, the life and, and the way we talk about the building which was really, and I mentioned earlier, we had to spend a lot of time ensuring that the various organisations were in the right place in the building. So the, the rack and stack was how we spent a huge number of months at the start of the project. It was a very tight building, it was a very limited budget, um, and certainly what you could build for that, the number of floors and the area and the volume you could build in that was, was, was defined. So getting everybody in there and their demands and the desires was tricky. It was almost like putting a jigsaw puzzle together. But once we understood the proximities, we needed to understand the fairly key um, moments within the building. So we, we develop the sort of vertical spine of collaborative spaces and, and addressed a number of sort of special spaces which included the street, the ground realm, uh, the tea room, a uh, very simply called um, space in the building which was the, the key um, location of collaboration and accidental uh, conversation and then the boardroom or the kind of more formal meeting space at the top of the building. Uh, and this just shows how we had to deal with the streets. So we were dealing with clinicians coming across from uh, the hospitals and Royal Parade that were entering from the west and then going through a fairly secure environment to go up the building. And as you went up the building, the building almost became more secure. Uh, and then the undergraduates and postgraduates coming from the east uh, through a different level of security and control. So that was, was sort of fundamental how people could access the building. And this is the view towards the reception desk or the security desk coming from uh, the West. Um, one of the things that we wanted to do with 
these more public spaces is to have them warm and inviting. Again, it's a very, very secure building. The labs are quite sterile environments. So you wanted those spaces that, um, that weren't that to be more uh, free flowing and warmer and hence a more sort of seamless architecture. Uh, we also located an auditorium in that entrance space so that for um, talks and presentations, uh, they could be open to the public. They could be more easily accessible. And there was also an exhibition space at the top of the auditorium that opened out into that foyer space. Uh, and then the, the, the route from the east, from the, uh, the university through to the student teaching labs was much more um, easily accessible. Then going up the building, the, uh, there are a number of sort of special spaces and the tea room was the key one where everybody was coming for their morning tea or their lunch. So the whole building could come together in one space. Uh, and enjoy time together. So we, we developed a, a level of flexible furniture and inside outside with operable walls so that you can actually take advantage of the, the north facing aspect and look across that by a medical precinct across at the Royal Women's and Royal Melbourne Hospital and, and the VCCC which was built uh, after, um, or completed after we completed our work. And then to the top where the Burnett room, which was the boardroom, was another special space that, uh, that opened out so you've got the better views it was also where all of the various institutes came together uh, to make those sort of critical decisions as a singular body. Uh, then the most important part of the, the building is obviously the laboratories and how they were organised. So making sure that these fitted into the building was key and that they were flexible so the various organisations could expand and contract and, and share as needed. So locating the labs in the center of the building, supported by uh, the, the building plant and lab, lab support to the south, because there was an expectation that there was gonna be a high rise development behind the building. Uh, and then the write up spaces or the office space, the workspace to the north, because uh, over time, Sharon can talk about this, more and more uh, work is done out of laboratory as laboratories become more and more automated or semi-automated. Um, so actually surrounding those laboratories with office allowed um, where you were doing most of your work to be north facing so you had access to daylight. But we also made sure that we put glass screens between those workspaces and the labs so that labs could share some of that northern aspect and light um, and you could actually see what was going on. So when you were in either space, there was, there was a very clear visual connection. Uh, and then this is just a photograph of a very empty lab. But um, obviously we had to plan these for flexibility and singularity in a way so that there was a commonality between what uh, the various organisations had or had specified. But again, as Sharon was saying, there were technical differences in terms of what they need or what they did. Uh, and then other, other parts of the building. So here's, here's on the left a lab that's actually uh, been occupied. And there are different levels of containment and quarantine levels through the laboratories from PC1 to PC4, PC4 being the, the, the high containment where you have to suit up to get into those labs. And again, I'm sure Sharon will touch on those. And then through other spaces, through the animal house on the roof or other um, very kind of significant levels of servicing and support for the labs, whether they're freezer farms or clean rooms or, or uh, other parts of the building as an electro microscope in the basement. Um, so it was fairly complex technically in terms of what needed to support those labs. And then finally, I guess the other key strategy was the envelope in terms of how we were going to deal with putting those workspaces on the northern aspect. And it was really the only way to get flexibility in the building um, to, to organise it as that plan suggested. Um, but then dealing with the sun and in terms of how much heat gain or solar gain you were going to get on that northern facade. So there was a very simple aspect or approach to the envelope which was uh, highly insul insulated southern facade where all the plant was and the expectation of high rise behind. And then on the east and the west, um, having uh, precast units, so heavy precast units that would protect from the lower sun. Um, and then they were integrated with uh, uh, curtain walling to the north. Um, as the um, product called Ocalux or Ocker wood supplied by Ocalux which included uh, an integrated um, Maranti timber batten system in the cavity within the uh, double glazed unit um, to create this, I think a beautiful effect, a very warm effect. It's obviously permanent shading, 
um, but it gives the whole building a warmth, both from the interior and the exterior. And I think a, a kind of delightful feeling inside the spaces and obviously very sustainable in terms of uh, its use of material. Uh, and the university particularly didn't really want an, an extensive amount of sun shading on the outside of the building through, uh, for reasons of, of, of operational maintenance costs and so forth. Um, and then as you went from the, the, the workspaces through to the meeting spaces, we were able to separate these, these patterns so you got a little bit more light in where these um, rooms were a bit more transient. Um, you could tolerate a little bit more um, light getting through. And that, they, they, were, they, I guess, were the key strategies as we, as we sort of went through the design process in terms of obviously getting the labs right, getting the public spaces right and how it addressed the street, getting the special uh, collaborative spaces um, in the right place in the building, and then ensuring that the fabric um, was, was A, both beautiful, but also high performing. Wow. That was a long answer to your question. So, um, I mean, that gives that gives a bit of an overview of, of kind of the building and maybe inform some questions. Well, and I'm now going to ask Sharon, based on that quite extensive response from Neil, did he get it right? <laughs> so then how does it work? So, what does it what what do those design strategies mean for the people who are using the building? You know, how how does that work? Um, yeah, well, I think his answer was brilliant and you, it, I mean, it, fantastic for me because you know, I just walk in there every day and assume that this is just, you know, um, just kind of go to work and don't think too much about all of this um, thinking behind, especially like that diagram of the three places of um, where people come together at the ground, the, you know, the fifth floor and the top. But no, it 100% works. Um, I think the, um, what I really love about the building is how it's um, uh, totally green and therefore manages heat and light very effectively. And I gather the baton, um, the wooden batons are part of that whole strategy. The light it, within the building, as um, Neil was saying, is beautiful and warm and variable throughout the day. Um, the area is for co where people congregate um, is uh, definitely work, both the tea room, the auditorium, the teaching rooms outside. Um, I haven't told you this, Neil, but we have our Christmas party across the whole lobby. Um, it's a great place for a big party as well. You can open up the whole thing with the mezzanine floor and the lower floor. Um, and that's one area that also students can just uh, walk through. Um, and uh, yeah, I think we, when I, especially when I see that diagram of the six departments, I feel that we're a very different organisation today, five years later, of course, with a lot happening along the way, including a major global pandemic in the last six months. But, you know, all of that as together with the built environment have really brought us into B1, one institute. So mentioning the unmentionable pandemic, which none of us can ignore at the moment, um, so the Institute was, was purpose designed for a pandemic. Do, do you want to expand a little bit more and explain what, what that actually means? How do you purpose design something for a pandemic? Well, it was purpose designed to bring people together that will be needed to meet any infectious diseases challenge. And um, infectious diseases, major you know, challenges of our time, um, up until you know January 2020, so the the big ones um, every year is in, in influenza, but we've got very used to living with influenza, um, HIV, TB, malaria. These are you know these are major global um, pandemics, and um, and more re and actually more recently, um, antimicrobial resistance or superbugs. And when you have um, uh, these sorts of problems at the scale that they are forgetting COVID, um, you do need basic fundamental research to understand the disease and to design vaccines, drugs and tests. You know, that's absolutely key to what we do. Um, a key bit, of course, is the immune response. You've got to understand the immune response in order to actually eventually design a treatment or vaccine. But you also need to, you can't do this all in, in test tubes and mice. You've got to be able to connect to what's happening in the clinic a, for the work, but B, to understand what are the important questions to ask. And then you've got to move beyond the clinic in infectious diseases into the community, and that's what public health is, where you can actually track, count, measure, 
intervene um, in the community. So we we have all of those sorts of disciplines within the Doherty and that means that we can tackle these big endemic problems, as I mentioned earlier, such as HIV, malaria, TB, but also deal with something at speed and scale in an emergency, which is what we're facing with COVID-19. And interestingly, most experts, infectious diseases experts, including the, um, the, the network that you mentioned earlier, Alison, a prize that I lead around Australia, which was basically funded to deal with infectious disease emergencies or pandemics, have always thought flu would be our next big, you know, the, the thing that would really sort of stop the world if we got a, a brand new strain of flu. And we have a practice run every year for flu because every year we have a different strain, have to develop a different vaccine, um, you have to track different um, strains of flu in the southern hemisphere, the northern hemisphere, and we've got an incredible um, critical mass of people that work on influenza. But then this new virus came along, which was actually quite different um, to anything that we knew. And within the building, we do have, we actually really only have one bona fide coronavirus expert, um, Kanta Subaru, who's worked on coronaviruses. But you have this new virus and suddenly you need to draw on all of the expertise from um, these other disciplines. And so what we've found is that the experts that were actually experts on superbugs, um, one example, Ben Howden from Microbiology Diagnostic Unit, he's an expert on superbugs, but he also is an expert on looking at the genetic code of, um, of bacteria, which he can now apply, which he has applied to viruses. He's doing all the genomic tracking in Victoria of coronavirus, which we won't speak about, but very, very important, um, important component of the response. You've had people that primarily have looked after um, bacterial infections and they're designing the clinical trials. You look at our diagnostic um, labs that um, have loads of experience in virus diagnostics, mainly HIV and viral hepatitis, but they're bringing it all to coronavirus. You look at the level four laboratory, the um, area, high containment area that Neil showed you of people in spacesuits, you know, that you, we could draw in all this expertise modeling. Um, you would have heard about the, everyone knows about flattening the curve and R zero and the mathematical models that have informed the, um, the policies of the Australian government. That's all come from the Doherty, Jody McVernon, who did all that work on flu. So we had all this expertise in other areas. You do not know where that next new virus is going to come from, who it's going to affect and the tools you need. So um, I'm glad we had five years before coronavirus came though, because um, there's no doubt, uh, as good as the building was in bringing people together, the, um, the uh, expertise, you know, working as a single entity and understanding each other, understanding those differences in culture and, um, and expertise did take time. It didn't happen overnight. And we had sort of five years practice to really, you know, kind of respond so effectively as we have done for COVID. Um, so what have you learnt in that, I mean, and I know it's this, we're, you know, we're still in the midst of it. Um, I'd like to think it's ending soon. I'm fairly sure it's not. And, um, but, but have you learnt anything about the building um, in the context of responding to this, to this current pandemic? Well, I think our learnings about from the building came on from everything we did before March 27th. <laughs> Because unfortunately, no matter how good the building is um, in bringing us all together from about March 27th, we've all been working at home unless, you, you know, we're obviously about 30% of the building stayed active because we were doing nearly the majority of tests in Victoria. I should add that the coronavirus test for Victoria and Australia was designed at the Doherty by Mike Catton and Julian Druce. And um, in the early phases of the outbreak, we were doing pretty much all the testing for Victoria, about 3,000 tests a day. We're now doing 25,000 tests a day. We're doing about 10% of them. So, of course, the people doing the testing are clinicians, um, and we built a very large body of researchers working on COVID vaccines, drugs, um, tests, uh, and all those people had to be at work. But as of March 27th, <laughs> Most of us have not been able to be at work and everything has moved to Zoom. So, um, but until that time, uh, we, you know, this, this, the, the building worked incredibly well. One example I like to use is um, 
We diagnosed the first case of COVID in Australia on January 24th, um, and Mike and his team grew the virus January the 29th. And so from that moment on, it has been very, very intense time for a very large number of people at the Doherty. Enormous amounts of information flooding um, in all areas um, uh, and all disciplines. So we had been meeting daily from February the 1st until around um, late March in the boardroom on the fourth floor, which is where my office is. And so it was really a great way that we came together every single day um, and, and were able to speak across these very diverse disciplines, you know, what was happening in epidemiology, public health, testing, um, vaccine design. We've since, of course, had to move to Zoom. Um, and, uh, but the other, the other, I should also say the, um, the engine room of the Institute with COVID has been our high containment lab because you, as I think most people will know, you cannot study SARS-CoV-2 or the virus that causes COVID-19 in a regular lab. You have to be in a high containment lab. We call it level three, not with the space suits, but just one level below. And we have one of the biggest um, areas of high containment in the state um, and in the country. And it, it, it serves as both this, um, um, you know, huge load we have for diagnostic purposes as well as the research sector. So the high containment lab has been absolutely core to our ability to respond. And we're now thinking a lot about um, whether we're really equipped, um, whether we, we could do with bigger um, facilities and um, other facilities that you need within a high containment lab to, to discover new drugs, et cetera. And we're now thinking about the future. We have a fabulous building, great high containment labs, but to be equipped for the future, we probably need something bigger and better. That is probably a great time actually to throw to one of the questions we've got that have come in. We've had a couple of questions come in. Um, and the, the, the question is about what you would like to change in the building to improve its functionality. Is, is there anything? Um, yeah, well, that, I um, the building was designed according to departments. Uh, so you saw the the um, the, um, the the schematic from from Neil earlier. Actually, Neil, could I just get you to go to the next slide? Yeah, this is I mentioned earlier. This is our vision um, to improve health globally through discovery, research, treatment, prevention, and cure of all infectious diseases. And if you go to the next slide. You know, this is how the, 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 the building was designed according to departments, which are very important, sort of the family unit for each person has their own department. But um, what we do across the, across the building is research, education and public health. And if you just go to the next slide. And we've actually aligned ourselves, um, although we still have the departmental structure according to major themes, which are largely um, targeted to major challenges. So um, immunology, healthcare associated infections, and antimicrobial resistance, so you know, what we know as superbugs, viral infectious diseases, clearly a biggie, and something called host pathogen interactions. And I think if I designed um, the building now, after five years of being together, and maybe if we get an opportunity to even expand, I would try and design it around the problems we're addressing, not the departments we work in. Because um, we've relied, the departments we work in are very important. Um, they're, they're people's discipline homes, they're people's cultural homes, they're, they're people's families. But you really, and we're relying on these sort of three areas where you bump into people. There's not a lot of bumping into people in the Doherty because of the security that we require across the Institute. So we, you need swipe cards to get most places and we're trying to get most people into most places. But, um, but I think if I had an annex or a second building, I'd do it around problems we want to solve, not so much departments we work in. Okay. That's interesting. You up for that challenge, Neil? <laughs> well, it might make the stakeholder engagement process a little bit simpler. But um, <laughs> oh, I think uh, it'll be much more complicated. <laughs> I think uh, it'll be simpler to do now that we know each other, and it may not actually. You might not even have have everything like that, but um, you are. You know, I think you could do it maybe now. I, I, I doubt you could have done it five. You know, eight, well, you started on this 
10 years ago, wasn't it? No, I think, I think 11, uh, 11 or 12, actually. It's a long time. So we finished the building in 2014. So it's just, uh, it's, it's a pleasure to actually kind of uh, reappraise it, to be honest. But um, uh, yeah, I mean, I think, I think through that process of getting those organizations that had their own identity and had their own existing workplace in the precincts into one building, there was still obviously a, a very strong definition around that area and, and the, the space allocation within the building. I think, um, I think if we were to go through the process again, as Sharon said, I think the benefit probably would be uh, a, a greater efficiency of space. Um, I mean, we did co-locate organizations together so they could share equipment or there were certain things that were serviced um, across spaces, but um, you, might, you might have an opportunity for a, a greater level of uh, common space, I guess. And I think that was the one thing that actually got quite tight on a on a floor by floor basis as you went up the building, because obviously the laboratories and the workplaces were the most important spaces to get right. So those kind of softer expansion spaces were um, a little bit tighter than than ideal at times. I've got another question here, which um, would relate to the, the the new annex that you're going to be getting, Sharon. Um, <laughs> New building, thank you very much. The new much. building, the whole new building. <laughs> but it's an interesting question in the, in the context of the current pandemic, and I'm sure it's one that many workplaces are dealing with at the moment, and it's whether or not you would keep open plan offices. In there. Yeah, well, you know, really, um, how much office space do you need? Um, I think a lot of, of course, if you work in a laboratory, um, not everyone does in our, our um, institute, of course, but a large number do or work seeing patients or work in a diagnostic laboratory, you know, you've got to be at work, you can't do it from home. Um, yet, you know, maybe who knows, it might change, but you absolutely have to be in the in the lab. Um, but, you know, Hammett, we, 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 and I'm sure Neil will speak about this, so I think office space and size of your office is a very heavily regulated thing in a place like a university you know whether you're um whether you're a professor you get x meters and downwards from there um you know how how how, how much need there is for office space i think the idea that you have to be in single rooms you know i um we will be leaving differently with covid for a long time uh, we will, I'm confident I'm, and hopeful we'll get a vaccine. Um, it doesn't mean that we will be leave, living physically distanced from people um, forever. I really don't believe that. I do, I think these sorts of things influence how hospitals are designed, um, that there's a real need for single rooms for a whole range of reasons in hospitals. I don't think for workplaces we're going to look at a life of, you know, masks outside and sitting in your own office with no mask. I think what will change change is greater flexibility. I mean, every every workplace is discussing this when um, we're not um, anything unique. But people have really got a taste for what it's like to work at home and how you can make things work from home, no matter who you are. Um, I, I've always worked a day at home, but, you know, my secretary never has, but she has now and she's, you know, probably enjoys it and might like to do more of it as we go forward, as do all, all people at all levels, all seniority. So we may just have less, we could do make it all labs and have hardly any office space. That would be great. Get more work done. Neil, do you have anything you want to contribute to that? And that's probably in the, in the broader context of Grimshaw more broadly looking at that. Oh, I, th I, th I think it's a fascinating conversation. I'm sure as, as architects across the industry, we're all, uh, we're all thinking about what the future, what the post COVID uh, world is in terms of workspace. I mean, clearly densities are likely to change. I think in some respects, it'll almost be a back to the 70s in terms of moving from, I don't know, eight to 10 square meters per person and back to 12 to 14. I think something like that will happen where we won't be as dense. Um, I do think workspaces will still be required or still be needed. I mean, after, um, you know, here in Melbourne, we're at week 20, 19, 20, I think in terms of uh, the lockdown. So I think the the energy and the ambition to be back in spaces where you can collaborate and you can coexist with your peers and your workmates. I think it will be you know nothing's going to change there. But um, I mean other other types of projects that we're working on. I think there will be uh, different design approaches, which will be principally about hygiene. I think whether you talk about sports facilities or or, or other, um, you know, stations, those kind of things. I think the design of um, toilets and those kind of things might be 
uh, have a kind of a little bit of a refocus or a tweak on how how they're organised. Um, but I think I think workplace there'll be we'll have a little bit more space. Uh, maybe organisations will want a little bit less area. But it's, it's intriguing actually. A kind of shift like this in terms of what it means on uh, building design is 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 uh, of great intrigue. Um. Sharon, I've got another question that's come in, um, and it's it relates to again to the institute's response to COVID. And it's so it's the question is, you know, aside from the, having to work from home, have you had to reconfigure any of the workspaces um, to deal with the work that's being done on COVID within the institute? Um, we certainly have had to reconfigure office um, offices so that you know, to meet this, because uh, as I said earlier, even in the extreme lockdown, we had about 25% of the Institute working uh, because they were in central services or doing COVID related research. So while in that phase, in order to meet the requirements on physical distancing, there was a shift in, in how, in where people sat. And then we increased it up to about 60%, which is where, where, are now, where we are now. And that has let, and it led to some office realignment. Um, with regard to the laboratory space, um, we haven't done any major, major shifts. Uh, we've, we, what, we, what we have seen though is more shared services. So within the Institute, we have two diagnostic labs. Um, they, they're, they're called reference labs. That basically means that it's a laboratory that, that does fancy specialised tests that other common pathology labs can't do. Um, and one of those reference labs is sits in the hospital and one of it sits in the university. And they've got actually very separate sort of processing of their um, specimens. I'm sure Neil will remember this part. Um, and that, that's one area that we would like to see more synergy. But there's a lot more sharing of activity across those two laboratories. As we've had to, you know, what a lot of discussion in pandemic response about surge capability. The Doherty, um, as it's was designed, I didn't mention this earlier, but it's actually important, not just to bring in the different disciplines, but a capacity to surge. So, you know, when we were doing um, the, the, the laboratory that does the testing for COVID, we're now doing, as I said earlier, 25,000 tests a day in Victoria. That was unheard of. In the Doherty, in that lab, um, the viral characterization lab, they would normally do 100 tests a day. They had to go from 100 to two and a half, to 3,000 tests over about a three week period. So you need surge capacity and we could draw on, we could draw actually people from other parts of the um, building that were in totally different areas. And the surge capacity meant that this other laboratory, this the um, public health reference lab that is in the university that normally doesn't do anything to do with viruses is also now doing testing and also doing a really important key component of of the genetic testing of the virus. So we've just, we've used um, the work, the COVID work has sort of infiltrated a lot of what we do. There hasn't been any real physical reshaping. And unfortunately, we've used less and less of our, um, our, our shared rooms, such as the boardrooms, still using the tea room physically distanced. I've got a, a question here, um, which came in um, a little bit ago, and it's quite specific, but I'm very interested in the answer to this one as well. It's a question for you, Neil, and it's to do with the very beautiful timber shading framework, which the, the questioner has commented the beautiful effect. But their question is, does it comply with fire cladding requirements? Uh, well, all, uh, I think architects have all have been looking at all of their um, specified material. Um, and, and we've, like others, have gone through and, and assessed what um, what compliance regime there is uh, in terms of uh, co-compliance now. I mean, the, the Moranti timber sits within a, a vacuum sealed uh, cavity within the double glazed unit. So it's completely sealed by the glass. And, and uh, yes, as I understand, does comply with that. Um, obviously, the building has a very significant um, uh, fire protection system, given that it's laboratories in there. So there's a huge amount of gas being used in the building. So it's got a very very extensive um, uh, fire control system within within the facility as well. Okay. Um, um, I'm just checking to see what other questions we have. We have a question here, which I'm not sure if either of you could answer this, but it'll be interesting. Now, you may have had some insight. 
what made this design the winning design compared to the others that were put forward for the Doherty? Uh, well, you probably don't have the right people on this uh, on this call <laughs> so, to, to answer that. But what, what I would say is that uh, there wasn't a design at the point of selection. So there was a strategic brief that existed, uh, and then we tendered for the the scheme design and the delivery of the building. So it was more about approach, and process, and uh, capability, I guess, and experience. So this wasn't a design competition in terms of what was the product going to look like. This was this was about getting the right team on board um, with the, the expectations that they would be able to deliver something that was high performing and, and hopefully elegant as well. Um, I think it personally, I think it's incredibly elegant. Um, Sharon, there's a question here, and it sort of goes more broadly to the type of work that the Doherty does, and it's a question around whether or not in the the work that you're doing around pandemic control, do you also integrate social research, so social behavioural research into pandemic control? Uh, great question. Um, social behavioural research is really important in any aspects of public health. You know, we might know what we want to do or what might address the challenge, but getting people to do it is the biggest challenge and a great example is you know what we're hearing is been going on in Victoria around perceptions of testing or wanting to test why people do or don't test why people do or don't um, stay home when they're sick you know social research hugely important we uh, do not have um, a strong expertise in social research one of the beauties of the Doherty is it's not an independent institute um, like most Melburnians would be familiar with with regard to Mel medical research institutes such as you know we hire just across the road from us or um, or the Flory. We're a unincorporated joint venture, which mean of the University of Melbourne and Royal Melbourne, which means that we can very easily tap into the extensive resources across the university. And so any social you know research we would do, and it, it is important, would be done with um, partners in our other parts of the Faculty of Medicine. Um, you know, another great example of the expertise that we have from being in a, as part of a large university is um, access to math mathematicians. So the um, duo that's done all the modelling, I mentioned Jodie McVernon, but it's done with James McCaw, who's a mathematician at the University of Melbourne. So we would, we would, um, we would you know, really love to do more um, social research, but it would be done in partnership with the experts within the university. Okay. Got a, a question here to do with the sustainability features of the building. Um, um, the question says, you know, other than passive solar strategy, were there or are there other sustainability features used in the design? Uh, well, there are a number of passive and active approaches. I mean, there's a cogen plant um, in the building. Um, so in terms of energy, uh, energy efficiency, it was uh, attacked fairly significantly in that respect. I mean, there was, I mentioned sort of co-location a plant within the building and equipment within the building so that could be shared to reduce power draw. Um, for me one of the uh, one of the kind of key things and it's it's relatively small but I think its impact is reasonably large is just outside the boardroom. I might just uh, if I can flick through um, just to an image just oh sorry pardon me just outside the boardroom there's the boardroom um, is a, um, a water filtration Area. It's only about 60 odd square meters, something like 900 plants and sand beds. So all of the, the grey waters filtered through here and used for um, uh, toilet flushing. So all of the buildings toilet flushing. So something like, I think it's about 1.4 megalitres uh, a year go through this. And, and it, it's obviously a visual amenity for the, the boardroom itself, but it's within a building that was fairly space constrained. Uh, the opportunity to celebrate some of those uh, sustainability features and and um, that's what it looks like now so this is a, a less beautiful photograph but it really shows as you walk past um, on the way to the boardroom you get this feeling of, of, of landscape. Um, uh, obviously the use of timber in the building was uh, a sustainability strategy in terms of minimization of embodied energy within uh, the products being selected. Um, uh, there's bike storage in the in the basement for students to use as you come to the the building and uh, end a trip facility, which wasn't 
particularly commonplace at the time. We designed this about a decade ago. Um, so there were a number, number of things that we, we did attempt to do with the building in terms of something that was a very, very high energy user. So where we could, we wanted to make the building as sustainable as possible and as responsible as possible. And it is five star, green star rated. Um, I'm, we actually, there are a few other questions here, but I realise we're running out of time. And I've got a, a key question that I like to ask in this. I think it's always quite illuminating. Um, so I'm going to go to those first because I'm the moderator and I get to choose. Um, I'd like to know from both of you, what's your favourite either function or space in the building? But also, what's the thing that once the building's been realised, Neil, and, and once you've been working in it, Sharon, what's the thing that's most surprised you? So what's your favourite bit and what surprised you the most about the building? Um, I'll keep it brief. Um, I have two favourite bits. <laughs> I actually really love the Burnett room, which is the room that you're looking at now. Um, and you're actually looking at an installation of Burnett's life, who was a previous who's one of our other um, fantastic Nobel Prize winners in immunology. And, um, and actually the four people are looking at a glass model of an influenza virus, um, which we purchased for Peter on the anniversary of his um, no, 20 year anniversary of his Nobel Prize. So I love the Burnett Room. It's got a beautiful warm feeling. You've got a fantastic view across the precinct. So you've got a real sense of where you are. And part of our success has been the fact that we're located in this very dynamic um, precinct. And my other favourite spot is, of course, the high containment lab. I'm a geeky virologist, and so therefore having um, so much high containment space that's in my background's HIV, we work level three, but level four um, is really extraordinary that um, we we're able to have that right in the middle of there's a level four build. Um, we just flick past it. People in spacesuits um, right in the heart of Melbourne. It's completely safe. Um, and we often always get these questions about how you know you've managed to build this here, but it's just fabulous that we have this capability. That's Leon Cayley, um, who was the first person to grow coronavirus in Australia. Um, and so they're my favourite two spots. Uh, what, su what surprises me? Um, I, I actually love the lifts. I love the lifts every morning. You get this sort of snapshot as you go up. There's glass on the outside um, looking over north, as you heard. And you also see every, every people busy at work. And when I go in there and out of there each day, very early and very late over the last five months since February the 1st, where we've been, where so many people have been working night and day on COVID-19, you know, you just see the place um, buzzing with activity, um, no matter what time you're zipping up and down those lifts. So I like the lifts. Neil, yours. Oh, um, oh there's a number of details I like. Um, uh, I quite like the precast stair treads on, on the upper levels of the building. So if you're talking about an architecture of kind of finite detail. Um, I mean, one thing I, 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 I I think was was quite nice is the way that the uh, the the lobby space actually dealt with the public realm because as I said we we really needed the building not to be a fortress we needed it to be transparent and um, and inviting and certainly warm which was driven by the, the the specification or the use of timber within these spaces but I quite like the way that the facade kind of meanders uh, around the column so sometimes the columns are inboard sometimes they're outboard and we've actually put seating on both sides so there's concrete seats outside that glass line and there's there's um uh, softer furniture on the inside i mean it's just a shame at the moment that most of that is completely um swamped by hoardings for metro but ultimately when metro goes and the street will actually be calmer than it was before it started uh, I think the engagement of the building at street level and at a at public realm, I think I'm, I'm quite pleased with that. Um, in terms of surprise, I don't know. Uh, I'm, knowing the building intrinsically and kind of being in, involved in the process all the way through, there's probably not too much that surprises me, but I'm, I'm endeared by the fact and, in, and encouraged by the fact that the building, obviously is a, a really important building for science and research, uh, has maintained and, and succeeded in making uh, these kind of investigations that are happening right now incredibly important. So the building, it's always great as an architect, your building um, or your work is doing something incredibly important for uh, the community and, and the city and the country in this respect. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, 
for me, it's a building I really hadn't paid much attention to, I have to admit. So I've found it fantastic um, listening to, finding out about the challenges, the complexities, um, you know, the what it takes to create a building such as this. Um, you're both incredibly busy people. So thank you both so much for taking time out of a Sunday to come and speak to us all. Um, and for everyone watching, again, thank you for taking part. Um, stay home, stay safe. There's still lots of open house Melbourne you can enjoy from your lounge room, so please do that. Um, and yeah, thank you for what's been a fantastic um, presentation today. Neil, I've been told you wanted to say something at this point as oh, well. No, just really to thank you both. Um, thank you to Professor Sharon Lewin and, and yourself, Alison. Um, it's, it's um, I mentioned this earlier, it's always intriguing to look back on your work, particularly as you left it sort of six, seven years ago. So uh, I think the opportunity to engage and thank you for your time on a Sunday morning as well. Uh, to to discuss this project and, and Sharon's particularly important work. So thanks again. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thanks for those attending.